So our next speaker will be Dr. Akban Abu, who's one of our senior fellows here at Emory. He's been spending the past couple of years doing research on ventilator-associated events, and so he'll be speaking to us about the definition. Thank you. So as you mentioned, I'll be talking about how to define and prevent ventilator-associated events. So I'm going to spend the first part of the talk giving a general overview of VAEs, and then I'll spend the latter half of the talk discussing four articles that are relevant to VAE prevention. I have nothing, uh, no conflicts of interest to disclose. So VAE surveillance started in the CDC's National uh, Healthcare Safety Network back in January of 2013, replacing VAP surveillance with the old VAP definitions. The shift towards VAE expanded the focus of surveillance beyond just VAP to include other potential complications of mechanical ventilation, such as fluid overload and ARDS. And VAEs also address some of the limitations of VAP surveillance, such as the subjectivity of the case definitions for VAP that could lead to inter-observer variability during surveillance, and also the complexity of these, uh, the case definitions for VAP that made the process of surveillance time-consuming. So the VAE definitions are based on objective data that can be obtained directly from the electronic medical record. And so by this, the definitions were specifically designed so that the process of surveillance could be automated. Now, it should be noted that the VA metric should be used for surveillance and for quality improvement. And it was not designed for the clinical management of patients. And VAE does not replace VAP as a clinical diagnosis. Surveillance is currently limited to adult inpatient locations. And as of right now, there are almost 2,000 healthcare facilities that are reporting data. And based on feedback from these healthcare facilities, the original VAE definitions have been modified and improved. So the current VAE definition algorithm has three tiers. The first tier is called a ventilator-associated condition, and, or a VAC. And a patient is considered to have a VAC if, after two or more consecutive days of a stable or decreasing daily minimum PEEP, or FiO2, the patient either has an increase in their daily minimum PEEP by at least three centimeters of water, or an increase in their daily minimum FiO2 by 20 percentage points. And that increase is sustained for at least two days, and that patient would be considered to have a VAC. The second tier in this definition algorithm is called an infection-related ventilator-associated complication, or IVAC. And this is a subset of VACs that have objective evidence of an infection based on an abnormal white blood cell count or abnormal temperature and new antibiotics that were started and continued for at least four days within a defined a period called the VAE window. The last uh, tier in this definition algorithm is called palpable ventilator-associated pneumonia. And this is a subset of IVACs that have uh, definitive evidence of a pulmonary infection. So there is still no national data um, available or that has been published about the incidence of VAEs. So the largest data about the incidence of VAEs comes from a single center retrospective cohort study that was published in 2004 uh, by Klompus and colleagues. And they looked at over 20,000 episodes of mechanical ventilation over a five year period. And they observed that about, they observed VAEs in about 6% of episodes of mechanical ventilation. So that's about six events per 100 episodes of mechanical ventilation. And this uh, number falls well within the range of other studies that have looked at the incidence of VAEs. And they've put the range of VAEs between four and seven episodes of, uh, of four or seven events per 100 uh, episodes of mechanical ventilation. The study by Clompus also looked at the distribution of uh, the incidence of mechanical, um, the incidence of VAEs among patients who are mechanically ventilated. And they found that the highest uh, incidence occurred in the medical ICUs and the lowest incidence occurred in uh, patients in the cardiac surgical ICUs. Now, there have been four case series that have been published that have tried to identify the clinical conditions that cause VAEs. Now, uh, the most recent of these uh, case series was a study published by Boyer and colleagues. And they looked at, prospectively looked at about 1,200 uh, consecutive episodes of mechanical ventilation. And um, they, what they observed is that ARDS, pneumonia, fluid overload, and atelectasis accounted for the majority of the 67 episodes, uh, the 67 VAE cases that they found during that one year period. And the other three studies that have looked at uh, clinical conditions that cause VAEs 
observed a similar finding. So it's now well established that ARDS, pneumonia, uh, fluid overload, and atelectasis are the foremost common causes of uh, VAEs. Why are VAEs important? Multiple studies have shown that VAEs are associated with an increase in hospital mortality, an increase in ICU and hospital length of stay, and an increase in the duration of mechanical ventilation. And looking specifically at hospital mortality, Klompus and colleagues observed that patients who have a VAE have almost twice the adjusted odds of uh, hospital mortality compared to patients who do not have a VAE. And so it's been well established now that VAEs and mechanically ventilated patients are associated with an increase in morbidity and mortality. And that makes them an attractive target for um, quality improvement efforts aimed at preventing um, VAEs from occurring. So clearly that raises the question, how do we prevent VAE? And there have been two approaches that have been suggested. All right, so the first approach aims at decreasing the duration of mechanical ventilation and thus decreasing the time at risk uh, for developing a VAE. The second approach aims at decreasing uh, the risk for the complications or the clinical conditions that can cause VAE, the four clinical conditions that I mentioned earlier. Now, there have been several um, interventions that have been well studied that have been shown to decrease duration of mechanical ventilation in, in mechanically ventilated patients. And there are also several interventions that have been shown to decrease the risk for the various clinical conditions that can cause uh, VAE. But unfortunately, there are very few studies that have looked at whether those interventions actually decrease um, the rates of VAE. So they look specifically at those interventions, studying them as, with VAE as an outcome. And so what I want to do now is highlight four interventions for which there are there is some data directly supporting their use as, uh, as an intervention to reduce the risk of VAEs. And these four interventions are minimizing sedative use, using paired spontaneous awakening and spontaneous uh, breathing trials, conservative fluid management, and low tidal volume uh, ventilation. Now, all four of these interventions are generally considered to be best practices in the management of patients who, um, who are being mechanically ventilated. And so what I want to do is just focus on four studies that provide some of the rationale for using these interventions uh, to decrease the risk of uh, VAEs in our ICUs. So the first study I want to talk about was published in CHESS in 2015, a study by Klompus and, and colleagues. And this was a single center retrospective cohort study that looked at the association between different sedatives and VAEs. The authors looked at over 9,000 consecutive episodes of mechanical ventilation that lasted for at least three days over about a seven year period. And they assessed the impact of daily sedative exposure on VAE risk, looking separately at benzodiazepines, propofol, and dexmedetomidine. So, so they looked at regimens that contained a specific agent and compared it to a regimen that did not contain that agent. And what they found was that regimens that uh, contained a benzodiazepine or regimens that contained propofol had an increased risk for VAEs compared to regimens that did not contain those agents. And they found that regimens that uh, contained dexmedetomidine did not increase the risk for VAEs. They also did head-to-head -head comparison for all of these agents. And what they found was that dexmedetomidine had a, a trend towards a decreased risk for VAEs when compared to propofol or benzodiazepines. But this uh, finding was not statistically significant. The study also um, found that Propofol, when compared to benzodiazepines, resulted in a decrease in the duration of mechanical ventilation. And they found that dexmedetomidine, when compared to both propofol or pro, um, uh, a benzodiazepine, also decreased, was, was associated with a decrease in duration of mechanical ventilation. And so, you know, current pain agitation and delirium guidelines recommend the use of a non-benzodiazepine, uh, such as propofol or dexmedetomidine, in favor of a benzodiazepine for sedation of patients. And it also recommends the use, uh, or recommends targeting the lightest level of sedation possible. And so what this uh, study suggests is that adherence to those pain, agitation, and delirium guidelines, and possibly favoring dexmedetomidine when appropriate, could possibly uh, decrease or lead to a decrease in VA rates in the ICU. The next study I want to talk about was a study also uh, published uh, by Klompus in the Blue Journal of, uh, in 2015. And it was a multi-center quality improvement study that looked at whether increased adherence to paired 
SATs and SVTs would decrease uh, VAE rates. And so it was a multi-center quality improvement study. It was done in 20 ICUs that were undergoing uh, daily VAE surveillance at that time. And 12 of those ICUs volunteered to implement a nursing and respiratory therapy driven protocol for paired SATs and SVTs. Uh, it's important to note that those, um, IC, all the ICUs already had policies recommending and suggesting that we do paired um, SATs and SVTs. However, compliance with that policy was um, uh, pretty poor at the start of the study. The other eight uh, ICUs did not implement this protocol and remained in VA surveillance uh, only group. The study was done over about a 19 month period and during that period, there were over 5,000 consecutive episodes of mechanical ventilation with about two thirds of them occurring in the ICUs that uh, implemented the protocol. So this table shows the results of the study and what you can see is, and, and it shows the results of it for the ICUs that uh, implemented the protocol for paired uh, SATs and SVTs. And what you can see is that over the course of the study, adherence to paired spontaneous awakening trials and spontaneous breathing trials uh, increased, and this increase was statistically uh, significant. And you can also see that the VAE rate over the course of the study decreased, and, and there was also a corresponding decrease in the IVAC rate. Now, the authors of, of the study concluded that this decrease in VAE rates was driven primarily by a decrease in duration of mechanical ventilation um, that they also saw in the study, which is a known association with uh, paired spontaneous awakening trials and spontaneous breathing trials. And these um, paired spontaneous awakening trials and spontaneous breathing trials are in line with pain, agitation, and delirium guidelines. And so what this study suggests is that they will also um, be effective in decreasing VAE rates. The third study I want to talk about um, was a secondary analysis of 304 patients from the BMW trial. And just a reminder, that the BMW trial was a multi-center randomized controlled trial that looked at BMP-driven diuresis versus usual care during weaning for mechanical ventilation. And so patients in the intervention group had daily BMPs drawn, and if that BMP was greater than 200, the patients were placed on fluid restriction and given a diuretic. And so um, when they reanalyzed this study, applying the VAE uh, definitions as an outcome, what they found is that patients in the intervention group had half of the number of VAEs compared to the usual care group. And this uh, difference was statistically significant. And they found in the intervention group that they had uh, a significantly lower mean daily fluid balances and a significantly shorter time to successful extubation. And so this finding is in line with the current thinking in critical care, that fluid overload is associated with uh, increase in morbidity and mortality, and is something that should be actively prevented. The last study that I want to talk about is a study that I performed here at Emory, looking at the association between tidal volume and the ventilator-associated events. And it was a matched nested case control study that used patients from eight ICUs at Emory University Hospital and Emory University Hospital Midtown over a two-year period. And so out of the 2,305 patients that were eligible for this study, I identified 190 VAE cases and matched them to 931 um, controls. Out of those 190 cases, about 70% of them were VAX. So what I found was that tidal volume or higher tidal volumes was, were significantly associated with an increase in the risk of developing a VAE. So for every one milliliter per kilogram of predicted body weight increase in your tidal volume, there was a 23% increase in your odds of developing a VAE during your um, episode of mechanical ventilation. And when I looked at patients whose tidal volume were, whose mean tidal volume was greater than 10.1, those patients had almost two and a half times the odds of developing a VAE compared to patients whose mean tidal volume was less than 7.4. And so, there is still no consensus about the ideal tidal volume for critically ill patients who do not have ARDS. But there is, I think, a growing body of evidence that points that to low tidal volume ventilation being beneficial for the majority of patients. And what this study suggests is that low tidal volume ventilation may also help decrease VAE rates. Other potential interventions um, that have been well studied that could possibly reduce VAE rates include early mobility in mechanically ventilated patients and also the use of conservative uh, transfusion threshold. 
Now, these have not been studied directly uh, in VAE patients, but it, it is likely that these will also be effective in uh, reducing VAE. So it's clear from the evidence that the first step in VAE prevention is increasing adherence to the best practices in the management of patients uh, who are undergoing mechanical ventilation. And to do this, we need to have accurate data on how well we adhere to these uh, key processes of care uh, in order to design you know, programs to improve our performance. And it's, it looks like the VAE metric could be a good outcome measure to help evaluate the impact of these quality improvement interventions. And also root cause analyses of uh, VAE cases could help identify areas for improvement for individual ICUs and for healthcare systems as a whole. So in summary, uh, the VAE metric is, uses objective clinical data to identify a wide range of potentially preventable complications. And VAE uh, prevention is important because VAEs are associated with an increase in morbidity and mortality. And these VAE prevention, these VAE prevention efforts <laughs> should focus on implementing best practices in mechanically ventilated patients. So I'll take any questions. <laughs>